Hello and welcome to the second season of Light Camera Inclusion, the first video series by Now and Next, the Canada Media Fund's editorial platform. We're here in Vancouver to meet some movers and shakers from the screen-based industry who are doing important work when it comes to representation, inclusive practices and teamwork. We're going to be talking to some very inspiring and brave creators, directors and leaders who have made it their mission to pave the way for the next generation of storytellers from across the country. Follow me. In this episode, we'll learn about the special connection between immersive technologies and indigenous creativity, thanks to Loretta Todd, a seasoned filmmaker who created the IM4 Lab, which provides microcredits in immersive learning to indigenous creators. We'll be joined later by two other indigenous matriarchs, filmmaker and educator Doreen Manuel, and multimedia artist and ethnobotanist Cees Weiss. Hi, Loretta. Thank you so much for joining me today. We're very honored to have you on the program. Uh, my first question to you is, what pushed you to create IM4Lab? And could you tell us about its main missions? I guess you'd almost be say there's multiple origin stories for the IM4Lab. One of the origin stories would be the fact that from the beginning, when I started making films, I was always interested in creating community. So when I was at film school, and I was the only indigenous person at film school at the time, I thought, I feel lonely, and not everybody wants to go to film school. So at the time, the late Len George and myself created um, a training program in memory of his father, the late Chief Dan George. And we created that over at uh, what is now Capilano University, but was then Capilano College, and it was one of the first indigenous training programs in, in Canada, it was way back in the day. Um, and many amazing uh, Indigenous filmmakers came out of that program. And so that's one of the origin stories. The other origin story is that, so I want to be inclusive, I want to build community, and that I think storytelling built is supposed to be about building community. And there is uh, these uh, values that we try to live by, which is reciprocity, redistribution of wealth, and really just that we're in a circle. Fast forward a little bit later, and a group of us created the Aboriginal Arts Centre, at the BAM Center with the same thing in mind, so that it wouldn't be just for a few people, it would be for everybody. That everybody would have an opportunity to come and express who they are through their art, whether it's filmmaking or dance or music or all the many ways you can express yourself you know, as, as a storyteller. And then fast forward into now, and so we were talking about virtual reality when we started the Aboriginal Arts Center. We organized something called CyberCon. We helped organize something called CyberCon 4, and I organized an event with um, Dr. Leroy Little Bear and the late Ahasu, and we talked about well, what does these technologies mean to us, and why are they? What are they going to do to our storytelling, to our community? So we were having that discussion then, but then VR was it, it was about VR in particular, but VR didn't really take off because the technology wasn't there yet. So fast forward to today, and t now VR is kind of coming back. It's, you know, NASA kind of perfected it, as did the military. And, you know, NASA actually used it to help uh, astronauts prepare to walk in space, even. So, you know, there was the technology had improved. There seemed to be, you know, uh, commerce, you know, economic, you know, possibilities with it, you know, gaming and so on. So I thought, we need to be here. We need to be here at the beginnings of these technologies when they're coming into our community. We need to be influencing them. We need to be um, shaping them to serve our needs, not just for us to um, be sort of um, taken up by them and you know exploited by them. We now actually need to be there at the beginning and make them our own, indigenize them. So that's always been kind of my um, what I do, I guess. It's sort of like my own Your mission. Yeah, yeah, my own my own mission, I guess, in life. So I saw VR coming back into our communities and, and artists were being commissioned and they did amazing work and it was really beautiful. But I thought, are we going to encounter sort of similar what we've seen before? When I got out of film school, I was told, you need more training. And, in, and when I would go and hire crews and I would be told that there's no native people to hire and I go, well, look at all the crew I have. I mean, I've been you know, making films uh, or making series 
and I've been hiring native crew, you know, 75, even 100 percent native crew, even though the industry is saying, oh, no, you guys aren't there. You need more training. You're, you know, you're not ready. So I didn't want that to happen with these new technologies with XR. I wanted to make sure that we were there at the beginning, that, that those um, technologies are free, inclusive, and that anybody who's interested, anybody who's motivated, doesn't matter if you're an artist, doesn't matter if you're a filmmaker, doesn't matter whether you're an elder, doesn't matter if you're uh, you know, a youth. If you're interested in you know, learning about these technologies, we'll offer you workshops, free, inclusive workshops. And if then it sparks interest, if it's something that excites you, something you want to do, then you, know, you can take more of our workshops as you go along. Um, since then, we've, tr we've offered about 40 workshops. Um, we've included about 300 people in those workshops. Many of them will repeat. So of that 300, there's a lot of people who come back. Um, we've commissioned AR. We've commissioned VR. And um, now we're in virtual production. We're doing the first ever Indigenous virtual production training program in the world. It's amazing. And, and going back to the role of technology, what is the role, impact, what role can technology play in language revitalization and cultural preservation? Well, you know, back in 2012, I created one of the first Indigenous Cree language apps called My Cree. I wasn't a programmer. You know, I was a filmmaker. I was, I was a person whose uh, grandparents and even my father were Cree speakers, but they didn't teach us. Um, so the, the language is all, was in my ears, was in my memory, but I, did, I didn't speak it. And at various times in my life, I have taken to try to relearn it. And, but I thought, here I am, a filmmaker, here I am, believing in innovation. Hey, I can create an app. I mean, at one point I had 19,000 downloads. It was free in, in the iStore. I haven't kept it up because it's, it, was a, you know, it was a big file and it would need to be kind of updated for today. Um, but nonetheless, I saw that if we're just sitting there with our phones, why not be learning our languages at the same time? But many other people have done that. And now there's real, you know, I don't know if there's um, scientific proof about how VR and, um, and AR and that work with, with respect to languages, but it certainly is how we've been applying it. So people have looked at this and they go, hey, you know, you can hold your phone up and you can, um, you know, put it over, the, you know, a fridge or a dog or a cat and, you know, the phone will give you the word, you know, and, and to speak the word for you. And so there's people making those kind of programs that, you know, in, in Indian country and, you know, or you can, you know, put VR and go into an environment that maybe doesn't exist anymore because of colonization, because of overdevelopment, because of, you know, environmental degradation, but you can experience what it was once before and hear the languages of your ancestors and from that be inspired to, to create, you know, to, to, to learn your language and, you know, immerse yourself in the language. What would you say because the I am for, you know, the concept of the indigenous matriarchs is so central to your project. Why is that? Why did it matter so much that you work as a collective? Well, when I sort of envisioning the I am for lab, one of the things I've been saying when I go to these CMF meetings and, you know, the BAM meetings, and, you know, I always sort of like, oh, there's Loretta again, saying it again. Why do we want to replicate their way of doing business? Why can't we create our own way of doing business? There was these brilliant indigenous lawyers like, you know, Val Napoleon, who started, you know, the indigenous law program at the University of Victoria. She talks about indigenous law. We have our own laws. We have our own ways of doing business. We had our own ways of doing commerce. So why can't we incorporate those into how we operate in this, this, this industry? And influence that industry even, because that industry is exhausted, let's face it, you know. Um, so, you know, they're making a lot of money, but, um, but at the same time, um, yeah, so what was important to me is if, if the, if the IM4 is based on principles of reciprocity, respect, and redistribution of wealth, then those are all things that have to also um, be incorporated into the governance. So what was important for me is not to have a president and secretary and treasurer. It was important to me that we look at it as a circle because that's how we do our business. You know, no one's greater, no one's lesser. We're all together in the circle. And then I also looked at these brilliant women that I've known for so many years, Jimmy Manuel, Tracy Kimbono, and C. Swice. All of them have been giving back to community like their whole 
life, really. Um, but it, particularly as media makers, as storytellers, there's so much each one of them have done for their communities and for the indigenous uh, media community. And I thought, well, one of the ways of, of honoring them would be to see if they would like to be part of this governance structure of the IM4 lab. But also because I knew that they're so brilliant, they've, they've been doing you know, similar work their, themselves, that they would be good um, guides. They would give us good advice. They would kind of make sure that we were doing things in a good way. And, and I could also give back to them um, as well, so that this idea, it, it, the circle keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and again, it's inclusive. And you know everybody is welcome in that circle. One last question before we conclude this segment with you. Um, you've said indigenous peoples are all storytellers. It's what shapes us. It's who we are. How does that influence or shape your approach as a filmmaker? Having said all indigenous people are storytellers um, means that we all have. Uh, a story to tell, but, we, but we're living our stories. We're also living our stories. And those stories are ones that are going to, you know, be, be remembered for not just the next generation, but, you know, subsequent generations. I think it was Maria Campbell in one of her works talks about how if you, if you don't do good to the people in your life, people will forget you. They won't tell your story. You, you, you won't be told. Um, and another great, uh, Métis leader uh, James Brady writes about similar, about these great leaders who went unknown and unremembered. And it's like all that we've been through, everything that we've had to endure through colonization, I don't want anybody to be unknown and unremembered. Or actively erased. And basically, that, you know, literally. And so maybe not everybody is a filmmaker, but everybody can, can uh, tell a story, everybody can share within their own safety, like but they're in their own comfort, the story of, of something that's was important to them, something that meant, well, has some meaning to them. And I think as filmmakers, as an indigenous film industry, uh, I think that's one of the kind of missions or tasks, if you like, that we have to do is to give the means to people to be able to tell their stories. So that it isn't just one, you know, filmmaker or one story that keeps getting retold over and over again. It's all those many stories. And there's so many stories to tell. There's love stories. There's, 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 you know, there's a lot of grief. There's a lot of sadness. But there's also, like I say, love stories. There's stories of people who've overcome you know, so many obstacles, who, who've had to deal with you know, so many things. And they just inspire me when I think about even the stories in my own family. I just think, wow. you know, uh, and, and, and I wish, it, to be honest, you know, because our family was so fragmented and broken up because of poverty and decolonization and you know my own choices in life to leave very young um, you know I'm only like my brother my oldest brother is one of the kind of the holders of a lot of these stories and sometimes he brings these out and they go oh my god my grandmother did that you know what I mean you know it's yeah, empowering it's very empowering mm -hmm. you know and and even those ones where you know maybe there was a little bit of you know you know, not always what, you know, anybody necessarily, you know, would do another time, but it's still, you know, a, a story. It's still a story that was important and that happened and, you know, it, it needs to be honored and, and recognized. And worth telling. And worth telling, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Loretta. Thank you. Thank you so much as well. Doreen, thank you for joining us. Um, thanks to both of you. I was curious to know when you first met, when did you start collaborating together? We met a long time ago. So, you know, Loretta was really good friends with my eldest sister. She worked for the union. My father was the uh, president of the union. So our relationship goes back a long time, but we started collaborating on IM4 when Loretta founded the program. And then she asked me to be a matriarch. And how has it been so far? It's been amazing to be in the, you know, the forefront of something, um, something so cutting edge and, you know, to, to explore the vast different uh, options with virtual reality, augmented reality and AI and, you know, starting to go into those kind of areas. I asked Loretta earlier, but I wanted to have your take as well on why does 
does it matter that you work as a collective? Why is it specifically important? Because mm. that's our culture. Because more thoughts and minds and input from different types of people is what makes it richer and fuller and, and make sure that we don't make mistakes and we don't make missteps. So one of your missions is to ensure that the next generation of storytellers, of indigenous storytellers, are equipped with the right tools and resources um, to tell the stories. And you've worked um, a lot in the education sector, and you've uh, made it your mission to, to facilitate that. You've talked about decolonizing education. Could you tell me more about that? Well, our education has, our education system has been stolen by colonization. We had an entire system in place at one time and it, it had to do with family. Our, our education came a lot through family and through experiences that were handed down and has been totally warped into something, some unhealthy way of understanding education where it's so uh, in segments where they learn in a foreign type of school building from people who aren't even related, who aren't even invested in their education. You go through that system, it's a separation of you from your family, from your parents, from the people who have the most knowledge about our culture. And so we need to bring back that way of teaching. And it, it took the responsibility away from the parents, the aunties, the uncles, and the grandparents. The ex and, and when you do that, um, a person's self-worth and identity adjusts and changes. We need to give that back, that role back to every family member and make them responsible so that everybody participates in that education. And when, when you're responsible personally for somebody's education, then you realize you have to enhance your own education to be able to educate them. And so you're working and you're learning and you're trying to be a better person. So, because we didn't teach just by lecturing, we taught by role modeling. So when I am a sound, whole, good person, the young ones will learn from me just by watching me. And so that's the goal. And that's the goal of going into elderhood is that one day I'd be um, worthy of being called an elder worthy of my young younger relatives, whether they be blood relatives or related to culture, that I'd be worthy to be a role model to them. And so it's putting back so many different systems and changing our whole sense of worth. You know, part of the reason why we have so many murdered missing women is because those women were raised in one way or another from the residential school, whether they were survivors or they were generational survivors, our women have lost their sense of worth and value in the world. And we need to put that back so that they learn and understand to protect themselves and to be role models to their young ones and to um, just really to know how much they're valued and how much they contribute to our society and our community. Of course. and. Uh... Does that, um, that guide your approach as well, um, Loretta, when you were talking about, you know, centering, because um, I think you mentioned at some point that, that that special relation between elders and children is so vital. Um, so there's a question for the both of you um, as filmmakers. Um, how, how does that guide your approach as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, honoring that relationship? Well, you know, one of the things I was lucky because a lot of my earlier films were with elders. So Forgotten Warriors with the veterans who were, you know, uh, elders and um, the learning path with people like, you know, Eva Cardinal, Dr. Ann Anderson and um, Olive, Dr. Olive Dickinson. These are people who made it their life's work to give back to, to like you, like, like Doreen says, to, to model, you know, to, 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 do, to do good and to always be sharing and, and, you know, continuing those roles. But what was really exciting to, to, for, the, for me, knowing, for instance, those women and also all those elders from the veterans films, is that they never stopped learning. They were always learning. They were always finding out new things about themselves, about their cultures, about the world. 
And it was so inspiring. And I think that's the other thing about Indigenous learning is it's lifelong learning. You know, it's uh, our educational system was like that. You know, it's not like, okay, now you got your PhD and you're really smart and you, <laughs> you know, I mean, I realize PhDs, people work really hard. So I'm not saying that they don't. But it's just really interesting to, to see how education is always um, growing and there's always something new to learn and, and just being open to that. And, you know, the people who, like us, you know, we're learning new technologies, you know, and, and, and in the virtual production training program, we have an elder in there, you know, and who's been making media for a very long time, but now is still keen to want, well, I wouldn't call him an elder, it's not fair to say that. But I mean, someone who has been making media for a long time and has decided, well, I'm not, I'm not finished yet. I want to keep learning more, and that's another role model. That role modeling, I think, that we, that you know, we need to do as well. So. Absolutely, and what? Because um, you mentioned, you know, the contribution from the matriarchs. What is um, Doreen's most precious quality, according <laughs> to you? According to me, well, you know, all those three women, Doreen, Cease, and Tracy, I look up to them so much because every one of their families in some ways has been good to my family. So it's a kind of a cultural kind of, you know, thing to, to also acknowledge that by doing good to their family because their family has been good to, to my family. Um, so those are things that, you know, I try, I try to instill in my life um, and, and practice in my life. Um, Doreen is somebody who is so, and as of the, so culturally knowledgeable, so um, and every day, everything is so effortlessly. She's working in this high power job. She has great responsibility. She takes a lot of responsibility for her family and her extended family and her, her nation and, and, and actually you know, carrying on the work of her father and her other you know, relatives who were so politically active. So she carries that on and yet, She'll post and you'll see that, oh, I made a star blanket last night. Oh, I, I beaded these boots last night. It's like, how do you do it? So, I mean, I guess it's the idea of tirelessness, you know, that, um, that sort of surrounding herself always in her culture and living her culture. I think those are the things that I really, really value about her. And, um, you know, we, we always know that Doreen will say it straight you know, what needs to be said. So we also, that's also important. That's another role of the matriarchs, you know, is that, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be able to tell the truth when it needs to be told. So we value that about her, but, but there's, there's, so, there's so many great things, you know. I feel really fortunate that she agreed to be part of this. I, because I knew her, their sister Vera is gone now. And, and um, you know, um, you know, I, I wondered when, you know, when Vera passed away, would that be the end of, of, you know, the relationship with the family? And it wasn't. So, so I really value that, too. Thank you. And uh, Doreen, how does Loretta inspire you? By seeing the future. Like, she looks well into the future. You know, I am for as a whole future uh, forward way of thinking. And, you know, the way she explained it is we need to be on the forefront. In the film industry, we're running and trying to catch up all the time. But uh, this is a new technology. We need to be thinking about the new things. And it really enhances our ability to tell story because story, our stories, are not just in one dimension. You know, they're three dimensional, but they're not just in those three dimensions. We, we have another dimension, our spirit world, that is part of this world. There is no separation of those worlds for us. You know, our spirits are right here around us and they give us messaging all the time. If we're willing to open our ears and our eyes and listen and pay attention. And so that can't really be captured wholly in film or in, in any other medium. So when we're looking at, at AI and virtual reality, those are mediums where you can, you can start incorporating the trueness of our story her thoughtfulness around science, because science was not a, a good subject for me in school. I mean, I really struggled in science. So when she first talked about, because she, she's so into science. And so when she first talked about this whole concept, it was kind of scary to me because I thought, oh my goodness, I don't barely learned how to use a film camera and all of those things and all something else. But you know, you learn in layers. So I've been to a whole bunch of workshops, relearning and relearning, and now it's, it's sticking finally. Um, but it's that whole uh, being a visionary, 
This is what Loretta is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doreen, for being with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been a wonderful three-way conversation so far. I wanted to ask you, how did you meet and when did you start working together? I believe I met Loretta, that we met um, when I was getting into film, just studying it and learning. And, uh, and in fact, my mother had told me about Loretta because she worked with Loretta while Loretta was going to school and working. <laughs> not working in the film industry, but working to get to the film industry. So my mother was like, the, the most important person for you to know is Loretta Todd. Wow, <laughs> that's a recommendation. <laughs> yeah, always listen to your mom. <laughs> Definitely. And yeah, she quite admired Loretta and her work, and she knew how, how long and hard she had really worked at getting into film and media. When you first um, heard about I Am Four Lab and the fact that Loretta wanted you to join, how did you feel? Oh, I was really excited and humbly grateful, uh, having spent a couple of decades working, predominantly training Indigenous youth uh, in several capacities and understanding that I was coming in to share that worldview and perspective and experience was really wonderful. Uh, like lifts you up to be able to get on board with somebody that is, you know, not just talking about it, but is actively creating a very positive impact in the community that we all need. So you're an ethnobotanist. Yes. Could you tell me about that? Well, ethnobotany is the study of the most ancient technology on earth. And it seems to really fit and flow with the most recent technology <laughs> on Earth. There's a connection there. Yeah, there's connections. Uh, you know, really, a lot of what we know about technology, the terminology, the way we process data and store it, and how a lot of things have to work with others to survive. There's so much that, uh, that overlaps and connects, like mycelium network is the equivalent of, the, of Wi-Fi and interconnectedness, and so thinking about you know, root systems, rhizomes, how they grow and support and reach out and thinking about technology and, you know, everything to me. It, I've always actually, when I've worked with youth, told them those two elements and how they actually are very much connected because people always think they're so far apart and in fact, they're one and the same. And one is packaged in pretty technology and the other is creating air and food systems and medicines for us. So it's, it's really beautiful. And to me, technology is beautiful. And I think of just, I'm just as fed by technology as I am by ancient forests and their interconnectedness. It seems like there's a natural fit between, you know, like the new digital technologies and um, the way that many indigenous peoples have evolved, like kept evolving with many elements, changing parameters, always adapting to new things. Um, what's your take on that? Well, well, you know, when we did that back in the day the, the, at the um, Aboriginal Arts Centre at BAMS, Leroy Little Bear, Dr. Leroy Little Bear was there, and I always use this, so people have heard this before, but he said, you know, when they were talking about VR, he said, you know, we've always had it you know, maybe not literally a headset and, you know, that, but this idea of going out on the land and basically transcending the physical, if you like, so that you're experiencing beyond, as Doreen says, you're experiencing what's here that's not seen, but it's there. And, you know, the late, great Brian Deloria talked about that too. He says, living with the unknown and living with the unseen. And those are things that, that's our culture. You know, and so the fact that we were able to then, you know, see these technologies as kind of an expression of that. But I really admire CIS because of the whole idea of being able to link, you know, the kind of growth systems and the communication systems of plants with the um, interconnectedness of technology, of, you know, the internet, you know, just to be able to make that connection is so important. It's important to, for our youth too because our youth can say hey this isn't something that's just 
you know, a Western guy, white guy thing, you know, you have to have a lot of money to do these technologies. It's like, oh yeah, this is an expression that we could look at as our own. It's because it's, this is the way the earth expresses itself. So we can adapt that and, and, and make, make th those technologies serve the same purpose in our lives as well. Now, it's a challenge because there are youth who, who you know, and we, we've, you know, the, the youth right now are kind of burnt out from technology, they're burnt out from the kind of um, pressure on them to, to sort of, you know, uh, be TikTokers and content sitting. They, they, they want to be, you know, indigenous people first and they want to just, you know, hang out and learn their culture and be with the land and so on. So it's really important that another reason why we adopt these technologies, indigenize them ourselves, because um, otherwise, you know, it, it, it's going to be there in our lives but it needs to be there in our lives on our terms, it, you know, the way that's going to work for them, not because they have to, you know, twist and, you know, become contorted, become these sort of technologists. From external pressure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, it needs to, they, it needs to feel it, tech, you know, organically. They need to see it, oh, well, I can use this for solar power, right? You know, I can create a, you know, something totally unique that's, you know, uniquely indigenous with these technologies. And so, I, you know, I, I think about that too and we do have to think about that because to be honest you know most of the people who've been coming to our training have been people in their 30s 40s and up um, some 20s but not too many teens the teens are interested in internet stuff you know they are they are interested in the kind of social element of that but but uh, you know there, there's they want to go out on the land they want to go on the land yeah. they also are really into games and gaming and they like things that kind of mimic it so I think it's like I've been really looking at the way young people interact with each other and, and also in a way disassociate together in a room. <laughs> That's so right. I could picture it while you were describing yeah. it. And it's, I don't know how else to describe it, but at the same time, they're very connected. Even if we think, oh, they're on, there's five devices going, there's a, there's a screen up there, there's a movie watch going on, somebody's playing a game, but yeah, like, they're all together, they're all connected, and they understand each other. And they also know that, I don't know, that it's not everything. Like, I think, I think that's why things like geocaching and other things have been very fascinating, because they use technology on the land and getting QR codes and interacting with uh, different AR apps are really exciting. That must be very empowering to them, like finding those connections. What's been your um, experience um, with young people who are kind of, you know, finding that out and feeling really connected to their, you know, their roots and, you know, as you said before, like not as some sort of, you know, oh, that's foreign to me, but no, we've been doing it for a long time. Yeah, like I've seen it in different capacities. Earlier this year, I was in a, in a festival on a frozen lake where, uh, there were all these sculptures, but there was also an element of technology and media. And one young AR artist in particular had, you know, a sculpture and AR. And I could hear young people talking to their grandparents or aunts and uncles and explaining technology to them. And I found it really fascinating to see young people like literally on the land or in this case on a frozen lake. <laughs> like talking about the importance of technology in the arts and, and in science and in so many ways. So I think one of the exciting things about IM4Lab is that we're, we're coming in and we're working with multiple age groups. We're not just training one. It's very intergenerational and it's very diverse because indigenous people are very diverse and we're all coming into a room with our ancestors. And so, you know, I think to a lot of people sometimes it might look like, oh, there's 10 or 20 people, but in all of our minds, there's like 10 to 20,000 people in there <laughs> with us learning and watching and witnessing us. And we do really feel the presence of our ancestors in that work. We're storytelling, we're, you know, we're training. Like I think about just that idea of like, today we go to schools and stuff, but you know, in pre-contact times, we were training every day our, our different like specialists in our community. 
we would find our way to them, you know. I want to carve, I want to learn medicines, I want to weave, you know. These are all things that, that were necessary to live, but they're also really important and intrinsic in the bonding between the ages and how people interconnect, hear the stories, and hear about um, the why we do things. And that's really what technology is about. Like, it's all of those things. Looking forward, I don't know, to the next like 10, 15 years, what is your vision for I'm for Lab? I would like some people who have a lot of money to redistribute their wealth. You know, we talk about land back, and there have been some settlers who have said, okay, you know, we benefited from this land, now we're going to give it back, and they've been giving it back. I say, I wouldn't say stories back, but, but similarly, you know, if we had the resources that we didn't have to go from grant to grant to grant, as, you know, as great as that is, as grateful as we are for that, if there was the kind of, kind of investment in what we're doing, I think, you know, the sky's the limit, really. I mean, I would love to see um, being able to produce VR on a regular basis, you know, that we can commission people. They don't have to worry about applying for a grant. They don't have to, all the equipment, all the technology, all the technical people are there for them, um, are there to, you know, to support them. I'd like to see that same with AR. Um, the virtual production is a, is, a, is a challenge because it's, it's, a, it's a much, you know, bigger um, form of technology that requires much more hardware, like LED screens and, and so on. But um, we're doing it, you know, we're doing it. Like I say, you know, 24 pe people from across Canada are going to be, you know, honoring them. Um, but it's, it's, that would be ideal. It would be ideal so that we could, and you know, c continue this. And it's interesting, Tracy Kimbona, who couldn't be, you know, because she lives outside of Vancouver. She says, we talk about futurisms. She has this beautiful way of looking about futurism as a seed. And, you know, we, we talk about our, when we started the virtual production training, we had a celebration and a feast, and we're going to celebrate it when we, it ends with a feast. And we asked your daughter, Sonakwa, to come up with a word that conveys that idea of a seed. And so we were calling that, that, that event by, the, the, by that name. But this idea of the seeds, Tracy talks about the seed. We've always had futurisms because we've always, you know, had to care for the seed. I mean, you know, a lot of non-Western culture doesn't think we had, you know, stewardship, don't think we had agriculture, don't think that, you know, we took care of the land. They just think we sort of lived here, sort of like, you know, but in fact, there was, you, know, you guys had amazing weirs and harvesting, yeah. you know, had to take care of the animals, had to take care of the plants, had to take care of, you know, the fish. And so um, that idea of the seed, that's what I see the I'm for as, and you know, taking from the, you know, that beautiful vision of, of Tracy's as well, is it's, it's a seed and we don't know where it could grow. You know, yeah, we, I was just gonna you know, say infinite possibilities yeah, yeah. with the seed and it is like, it's so precious and it's, it contains every new cycle that's gonna come ahead of us. Like that plant, you know, will, will exist inside whatever fruit or vegetable it's in until it's open and you know, with berries, we tend to eat them all right up, but, but they do fall and in their own way spread the next garden. So anything can happen with those seeds. They can tumble and hide and grow in a crack and, and uh, next thing they're this big luscious plant and they're producing flowers and getting pollinated and, and then being, uh, becoming a fruit and then the seed, next seed develops. So it's just that eternity and that really that infinite possibility element. And, and I think it's such a great metaphor, the seed as the futurism's uh, metaphor, because it really is, it's everything. It's fascinating that we can all do that too, and to build this kind of digital utopia for ourselves <laughs> and, and for others. Right. I mean, it's, not, it's a utopia because it's not just for us, it's like for everybody that comes into this realm of wanting to learn and understand and to, you know, to really like take note and grasp that knowledge and, and the infinite possibilities that go with it. So yeah, it's really cool. That's a beautiful note to end this conversation. We could have gone a lot longer, but thank you so much for sharing our, all your insights and knowledge. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chika.